Let us pray. Jesus, our advocate, in the darkness of Gethsemane, you wept for us. Shedding tears of blood, you shared our pain. Jesus, our Redeemer, on the way to the cross, you suffered for us. Tortured, spat upon, and despised, you carried our burdens. Jesus, our Savior, on the hill of Calvary, you died for us. Crucified and hung upon a tree, you released us into freedom. Son of the living God, Redeemer, Savior, Advocate, through the journey of suffering in the, in the place of darkness, you overcame death forever and brought us into newness of life. The Passion According to St. John Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police and the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of these whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that my father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? And those who heard what I said to them, they know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus, Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? And Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the, of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Back 
Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did you tell others about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is the truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed them over, him over to them, to be crucified.
So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew was called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two soldiers, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a great day of solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. 
And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. It is hard to believe that this is the second Good Friday that we have observed while we are still apart. Last Good Friday, of course, I was convinced that at some point we would soon be together. But now here we are over a year later, and we are still apart. And I reflect at the many ways in which the pandemic has changed us and changed the world in which we live in. But the one thing that it has not changed is the way in which we view Jesus' words from the cross. There are so many powerful statements that he makes that jump out at us. And the one that jumps out at me this day are the words of forgiveness that he speaks to his tormentors and to all those that wish him harm. Jesus speaks those words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he not only speaks them, but he means them. He has lived his life uttering those words, not only in words, but also in deeds. And that strikes me because I recently read an article entitled, How America Has Forgotten How to Forgive. The title was very intriguing, and so was the article. Of course, the question that title begs the question, did we as Americans or as human beings ever really know how to forgive one another? That is to say, were we ever that good at it? And I don't know that we were, because forgiveness has always been hard. People who were gathered around Jesus couldn't understand it, and I think sometimes we hear those words again, and we have a hard time understanding it as well. Forgiveness is difficult. One of the parts of Jesus' life that speaks to me most about his divinity are those words, because it is simply not human to forgive people in the way in which Jesus does. And yet we know that Jesus is still in the business of forgiving people, forgiving you and forgiving me. And so we too need to model our life and take Jesus' words to heart, to learn once again how it is to forgive one another, not only in words, but also in deeds, to forgive one another from our hearts. But the most powerful part of this day, of course, is Jesus' death. And during this last year, it seems that we have been surrounded by death, or at least the threat of death. Each year during the winter time, I go outside and I look at the way the landscape is so barren, how the snow is piled so high, how the temperatures are so cold, and I sometimes wonder to myself, 
as I'm looking out over at our yard and our neighborhood, I wonder, will anything ever grow again? Will spring ever come? Will there ever be new life springing forth from this barren landscape? And I had that same thought during this past year, during the pandemic. Will we ever return to, quote, normal? Will we ever do those things that in the past have given us such simple pleasures and such simple joys? Gathering together with family and friends around a dinner table, going out for coffee, having a friend over for lunch. All those little things that we have taken for granted, that we have missed for the last year. And sometimes one wonders, will those simple pleasures and joys ever return? But on Good Friday, we are reminded that death does not have the last word. In the midst of the most difficult and barren winter, we know that eventually spring will come. Green grass will emerge, the leaves will come back to the trees, and there will be some warmth and some sunshine. And I think that on Good Fridays, the Good Friday days of our lives, that is our greatest challenge. When we are surrounded by death, and confronted with death, we have to still believe in life. I have always liked the words that Jan Richardson writes in her book, Circles of Grace. She says, I promise you, this blessing has not abandoned you. I promise you this blessing is on its way back to you. I promise you when you least expect it, when you have given up your last hope, this blessing will rise green and whole and new. And that is what we are called to believe on this Good Friday, when we see Jesus once again hanging on the cross, suffering for our sake and dying. We are to believe that because God's power of love and grace is at work in this world, that death does not have the last word. Death does not hold Jesus. And because of that, we have the hope. We have the hope that winter will soon give way to spring, that the pandemic eventually will end, and life again will return. It is sometimes a tall task to believe that, but on Good Fridays, that is what we are asked to believe. That God in Christ is with us down all the roads that we walk upon, all the obstacles that we face, and that eventually life and love will prevail. Amen. Let us pray. God who created us suffers because of us. God who died upon the cross suffers for us. God who dwells inside us suffers with us. And in God's suffering, we find hope. God, our suffering God, your story brings us salvation. Without you, the horrors of human suffering would be unbearable. Your story gives life meaning. Because of your suffering, a new world has broken into ours. Your pain releases us from prison. Your agony frees us to live in love, joy, and peace. In your eternal resurrection world, amen.